copyright notice. You are free to download and copy this work in audio format for replay in any audio or video mode, and I encourage you to do so and enjoy and learn. You may redistribute it in a non-commercial fashion, that is, not-for-profit directly or indirectly. You may not sell or seek to profit from this publication in part or in whole, nor may you translate it into any written format for any purpose. Thank you. Chapter 14 of the e-novel, Survival Novel, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author. The Exodus. Standing in the sun outside the barracks, feeling the warmth of it on his face, dressed in jeans and a brown leather jacket, Phelps couldn't believe he was officially furloughed now. He had the papers, of course, and knew it was all legitimate, but he couldn't quite get his head around the idea. Nothing lately seemed real, though. Life had changed so drastically for them all. Rifle in hand, he stood by his combat gear and rucksack with a duffel bag of most of his gear and what personal possessions would fit at his feet. The rest was put in the supply cage in a couple of foot lockers. He wondered if he would ever get back to get them, though. That was the least of his thoughts right now. Stuffed in his front jacket pocket was a piece of paper, a chit for 120 gallons of diesel fuel. The commander had signed off on his and others' fuel allotments earlier. He wondered what the dollar value would be in today's economy. Not that dollars were worth much. Perhaps they never would be for that matter. Phelps had to marvel, though, at how the Army never let go of anything for free. Even now, old habits die hard, he guessed. The soldiers were allowed to take as many jerry cans as they needed to fill that allotment. There was a huge stack of them behind the motor pool. Diesel was quite plentiful, whereas gas was dwindling fast. Just as well, it didn't have a very long shelf life anyway. He wished he had a diesel vehicle now, but it was too late for that. Not a one could be had for any price because of this situation. He would go to his Aunt Ole in Van Buren, Maine, about as far north as you could get and still be in the United States. Reports indicated that, although the cold weather had caused tremendous casualties, this was offset by the fact that the hordes of refugees had streamed south cutting a swath of devastation not unlike a plague of locusts. He had no way of contacting her, though, and wondered if he was heading to a black hole, to nothing. What else could he do, though? It wasn't much of a plan, but at least it was something. Phelps felt sorry for those men who had nothing now and knew it. Those men were shell-shocked. They looked dazed. Many of them wept over the bad news, their friends comforting them as best they knew how. Men who had survived combat and war and seen death and destruction now seemed to be powerless, so without hope. He was glad, though, to be heading north. He knew the cities in the south had the worst time right now because of the tidal wave of human beings that had fled in the face of the collapse of the cities. He would head north, cutting against the grain, like he always did. It had always made his life hard to be this way, but it also meant that he had something. When he did, it was real. He could count on it. He thought of driving by himself. His little Honda car got good enough gas mileage that he could probably pull it off with just four extra jerry cans, but there was also the issue of security. He sensed that the car would be all but useless when he got to his destination anyway. Thus, he had opted to go with two other men headed generally that way. The S-1 had posted a bulletin board and men were encouraged to find someone else from their area by assembling in the stadium, holding a sign saying where you wanted to go. It was stupid, but it worked, so it wasn't stupid. Phelps had met two other men there. He didn't recognize their town names because he wasn't from Maine, but they recognized his. One man, a big jovial Irishman named McMonagall, came up and shook his hand with one of his ham-sized fists. Call me Butch, he insisted. Phelps wondered why he didn't want to be called Mac, but then somebody else in his unit probably already had that title. Every unit in the Army, it seemed, had a Mac, a Ski, a Swede, and somebody called Tex or Chief. The other soldier was the quintessential opposite, though, a quiet, tall, and slight fellow named Clarence. He was friendly but seemed lost in thought. 
probably worried just as much as anyone else. Butch didn't seem to show it if he was, though. Now the two men piled out. Butch was good-natured and seemed excited to get on the road. Clarence was a bit apprehensive, but both helped him toss his gear in the back of the pickup with the rest. Nearly half of the long bed was stacked with gear, and Butch lashed it all down with a tarp covering it. Phelps put his weapon, body armor, and assault pack with his chow and sensitive items in the back seat, which was already pretty full. Butch guided the massive diesel truck around the corner next to the supply cage, and there was a blur of soldiers moving around, dragging jerry cans and equipment out to their POVs or privately owned vehicles. The three of them picked up 40 of the five-gallon cans, which literally filled the rest of the bed from side to side. They also had gotten a nozzle for the cans. As the fuel, at the fuel point, they had to wait nearly three hours in line, though, as men were all going through the laborious process of filling five-gallon jerry cans. Even helping each other out, it was a time-consuming chore. When they finished, they all smelled like diesel. Butch wanted to roll right away, and that was fine with Phelps and Clarence. The plan was to go straight through, doing hot swap on the drivers, stopping only to make a bathroom break every now and then. All else would be done from the cab. They had no idea of the roads, so would have to go much slower at night, but were glad they all knew how to drive with PVS 14s. It felt odd leaving the post, probably for the last time, too. He had done the duffel bag drag more than a couple of times, but never with his weapon and three basic loads of ammo, fragmentation grenades, sensitive items, and other equipment. The gate guard was waving everyone off the post. It was highly illegal before the collapse to drive with your weapon in your POV. Now it was the new normal. As they drove out the gate, Clarence and Phelps locked and loaded, chambering around in their rifles. Phelps had been authorized to take an M9 pistol as well, and he locked and loaded that almost by instinct. Butch handed his weapon to Clarence without a word. Clarence wordlessly locked and loaded that for him, then laid across the dash. Everyone in the cab was a vet, and this seemed almost second nature to them. Phelps thought about that for a minute, then wedged his M9 in between the front seat, muzzled down for Butch, who said thanks without even looking. Phelps' pulse accelerated as it always did on a mission. He felt just as jumpy now as he did traveling on the IED-strewn roads of Iraq and Afghanistan. The reports indicated no IEDs being used, of course, but ambushes were quite common now. Unlike a road trip with his buddies in college, this would be a tedious and tiring drive. He was glad to note that Butch was not sparing the horses and had the diesel wound up to over 80 miles an hour while the road was still clear. Soon enough, they would be crawling, he figured. It beat walking, though. Anything beat ankle lift. Phelps frankly doubted they would make it, but then what other real choices did they have? Sick call. Kevin had recovered quickly. One day, he heard a strange voice in the house and went to investigate. It was a woman and knew it wasn't Jacqueline or Liz, so he walked into the kitchen. Seated at the table was a woman who looked up at him briefly and smiled, then went back to what she was doing. He stood there for a minute. She was quite beautiful, not glamorous, but something about her. He was very awkward with women, and he knew it. He knew he had spent too much time doing guy things and never had female friends and only dated a few women. He was told he was handsome by one of these women he had dated for a while, but he also knew he was no Casanova. The woman looked back up at him and smiled, brushed the hair out of her face, stood and said, Hi, my name is Linda. You must be Kevin. And she reached out her hand to shake his. It was a firm handshake, not hard, but not soft, not like other girls sometimes did. She looked at him oddly, and he realized he must be staring. He wanted to say something clever, something that in a brief moment would tell her that he was so much more than she apparently saw before. Um, it's uh, nice to meet you, idiot, he thought. That was smooth. She sat back down at the table with Jacqueline and said, uh, Glad to see you decided not to die on us, Kevin. 
and that kind of hurt a little, and he didn't know why. It was a good-natured comment, and he said, Thanks, it's a good uh, not to be dead. Good Lord, when had he forgotten to speak English anyway? Jacqueline grinned a little at him, and then looked down quickly at the book in front of the girls. It had something to do with seeds and planting. She looked like she was about to laugh, and he suddenly realized that he was looking foolish, so he said, well, I'm going to go chop some wood now, and rushed to get back to get his gloves and axe that he had been using just yesterday to do this very task. The ground was nearly thawed, and it would soon be time to plant, he was told, and he would learn. As he left, he could hear the two girls talking and decided he liked the sound of her voice. It was sweet and soft. As he swung the axe, he couldn't stop thinking of the woman. Who was she? Was she somebody's wife? He didn't see a wedding ring, but that didn't mean anything. She might be married and just not wearing it. He noted that with country women, they had working hands and sometimes did that. They were pretty, too, but in a different sort of natural way. When one of them looked pretty, you knew she was. You knew it wasn't makeup or camouflage, as his mom used to call it. She was probably married, he thought. No way a woman like that wasn't already taken. Uh, the story of his life. He had been in love once years ago, but that hadn't worked out. He knew he wasn't much with the ladies, and so spent all of his time at the gym, at the gun show, or just at work. He tried to put her out of his head and felt guilty that he was thinking of a woman that was no doubt someone else's wife. He felt kind of depressed about all of it now and was wondering how his mood could have shifted so quickly from happy to sad. Besides all this, there was too much to do today. Eagle's Lair Back at the clubhouse, Danny was looking through his files and the papers in his office, which was just a big closet, but it had a chair, a desk with some drawers, and a safe bolted to the floor, hidden under a rug underneath his chair. He closed the door and opened the safe, pulled out several files of papers. The office was neat and spartan. Danny was a meticulous and organized man, despite the rough biker demeanor. Had he chosen another walk in life, he might have been a businessman, a doctor, or an investment banker. He had the intellect and the discipline for it that was certain. The folder he had was a collection of articles and printed material he had collected over the years. There were files on his competitors, including names and addresses, as well as photos of key leaders. There were also folders on law enforcement officers, both those who were a threat to his business as well as those who had been paid off, including a list of payments and the dates of those payments. One folder was something he had begun back before the Y2K scare. It was as interesting to him for its business potential as it was unusual. It had piqued his interest for a number of reasons. Initially, he wanted to get the fallen into growing marijuana, and for that, they would need an isolated location, which had a lot to do with his purchase of their farm. That idea had fallen away, though, when the feds had figured out how to find these operations and take them down. The cost-to-gain ratio wasn't there. A grow operation took years to get the investment back. Meth was the way to go. A meth lab was easy to set up, easy to replace, and when it got taken down, you found another one to get your product from. Grow operations put off a heat signature. If you used electricity to heat your greenhouse, the electric bill drew attention. If you used propane or other fuel, the same. Marijuana was bulky and that created its own problems for shipment as well. This is why the article in his hand had gotten his attention initially. The article was about a supposed retreat being built by wealthy people to survive the Y2K disaster. It was to be completely isolated, completely self-contained, self-sustaining, secret, and easily defended. Danny knew you could never hold the government off, so he gave up on the idea of building a fortress like that for himself, but was intrigued by the ideas of how to hide in such a large place. What if he could set up dozens of meth labs in one location using this? They could defend from raids by rivals and also by being secret and self-contained would not be taken down so easily. Each takedown, although sustainable, was still costly, still set business back, sometimes costing him key people. 
Over the years, he had done a lot of research on it and, by piecing things together, had a general idea of where it was located. It was called the Eagle's Lair, which made Danny chuckle. Rich people always chose such lofty titles for themselves. Why not call it what it really was, the rat's nest, since much of the collapse the world had suffered had been because of the reckless gambling with world finances by these same folks? He wasn't making a moral judgment, but did consider that, as a meth-dealing biker, he at least wasn't pretending to be anything more than he was, unlike these people. Before the collapse, he thought of going to spy on it, to see what else he could learn. Now, though, he was looking at it for another reason entirely. The club had several mechanics, welders and machinists. Greaseball was the best, and he had been put in charge of a special mission by Danny. Nobody asked what it was for, but nearly half the club members had been working in the barn on modifying several stolen four-wheel drive diesel pickups to include large fuel tanks, extra armor plating, and all painted a flat black color. Headlights and taillights were painted over except for a tiny slit over the brake and running lights. In this way, men with PBS-14s could drive them at night in convoy. The trucks also had provision to mount the two crew serve weapons on the roll bar for added firepower, and even had a simple shield to protect the gunners. These were for fighting. They were war wagons, Danny thought, remembering the old John Wayne movie by that same name years ago. Lonely at the top. I held a weekly meeting at the farmhouse for the leaders only. This was a time when I trained the trainers, gave them classes or reinforced the training they already had, but it was much more than that. It was my time to inculcate values to them that they would need. A leader had to be much more than a proficient uh, soldier and tactician. They needed to understand that leadership is an art more than a science. I had to balance in them the resolution that a leader must stick to a plan, but also have the humility to realize when their plan was wrong and the courage to accept their mistake, to own it, and to fix it. We crowded into the guest room upstairs. The bed had been taken out and put in the main bedroom, and I sat on the corner of the desk, everyone else crowded into chairs or sitting upon boxes. I made sure we had coffee, although that was quite a luxury that we knew was running out. Still, I wanted these meetings to be special times that the men cherished. This was a time for fellowship as much as it was to learn. We sat wearing our weapons, sidearms, and rifles. I did this deliberately. I wanted the leaders to remember we were right now acting as warriors. Tomorrow morning we would be back to farming, back to homesteading, and rebuilding. But tonight we were warriors, and this was training just for the leaders of warriors. The leaders had all been elected by their squads in last week's town hall meetings. I prefaced the elections that day with this one statement. Elect the person who is going to accomplish the mission and bring you home alive. Looking in front of me, I was not surprised who was here, the veterans and people we had first appointed. I was elected as commander of the unit, but my choice was an old veteran from Vietnam who had seen a lot of combat himself. He was elected as platoon leader of the reserve platoon instead. I was glad he was essentially the number two if I couldn't get him to be number one. Friends, I began. I have a question. I paused and smiled and looked in their eyes as they slowly ended their sidebar conversations and turned to look at me. What is the one thing that we have which our enemies have yet to display? There was a moment of silence as everyone whispered a little at this question. My number two, Uncle Buckshot, smiled and waited to see if anyone else answered. When they didn't, he spoke one word, tactics. That word elicited nods from all as they looked to me to see if I agreed. The smile on my face indicated I did. Bill had been in a good bit of combat in Vietnam and knew that it wasn't so much about individual skill or weapons, although that did make a difference. The thing that won the fight, however, at the end of the day was the ability to implement proven, solid, and rehearsed tactics. Folks, 
I began, tactics are this. We rely upon un, upon proven methods of operation, applying the science of firepower, combined with maneuver, and ultimately focus on applying our strengths against the enemy's weaknesses. I paused for a moment to let the last piece of that sink in, and was heartened to see some note-taking. Continuing, I said, the only way you can use tactics is if your people are trained and you know what they are capable of. Many nods in the room and more note-taking. No matter how much you train, you as a leader must know their limitations and never pit your weaknesses against the enemy's strengths or even against his weaknesses. Heads lifted and some curious looks, so I explained. If you go week against week, the best you can hope for is parity. That is, you can hope to maybe not lose. The same if you go strength against strength. If you fight not to lose, the best you can hope for is perhaps not to. Eye contact now from everyone. Men, you will suffer unnecessary casualties in that way. I made a fist and slapped it against my palm. You must fight to win. If you fight to win, you will suffer some casualties. I stopped and the men looked up at me. As a leader, this is the hardest part of your duty. I continued, you will have to face the fact that the man or woman who we are burying may have died under your care, regardless if they made mistakes. Many sad looks now from some of my leaders. Some things are inevitable in war, but the feeling of grief and the pain will never leave you. Accept the responsibility for your mistakes. Learn from them and make sure you never repeat them. A couple of looks in the room told me that these who looked this way had already walked this lonely and miserable road before, and I prayed then that none would ever have to. Studying the history of war will help you learn how to not make those mistakes. Someone has already paid in blood for those lessons. We don't have to pay it again. I changed my tone now. Back to the subject of tactics, though. The Romans were largely undefeated on the field of battle, and yet they did not have the numbers, strengths, and sometimes even the maneuverability of their enemies that they beat. I smiled. They won because they knew what they were strong at, and always sought to maneuver the battlefield to capitalize on this advantage. I gave an example. Bob, your squad has some really good long shooters, men who know this terrain like the back of their hands, hunters. I looked at him directly and said, if you could engage your enemies out in the field, away from the town, you could use this ability to engage at a distance and then fade away into the terrain you already know. That would be an example of applying your strength to their weakness. They may be good shots, but if you know the terrain and can use it to your advantage, you have the clear advantage. He nodded thoughtfully, and I continued. The Roman leaders knew that their soldiers had practiced their basic drills thousands of times and could execute them under any condition, under any circumstance, and under anyone's leadership. The worst leader could call for a wedge formation, and it would be executed flawlessly. I explained, so even if it wasn't the right formation, it would work and often win simply because they were good at it. It is no less true with us as leaders. I could see the men were getting tired. It had been a long day, so I tried to boil it down. We can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bad guys and maybe win, but at what cost? Some looks up, but it was a rhetorical question, so I pressed on. We will lose people one day, no doubt, but... We should do all possible to keep those numbers as low or even non-existent as we can. I borrowed and modified a maxim from the military. The more we train here at home, the less we bleed out there in battle. This is why you must not only train your people as individual warriors, you must train them to operate and fight together as a team. I held up my left hand to emphasize fire, and then my right, and maneuver. I joined my hands together firmly. Fire and maneuver are the two most essential elements of tactics, people. Accurate fires on target, and the ability to maneuver your strengths against his weaknesses. I had a lot more to say, but could see I would lose them, so I decided to wrap it up with an example to help solidify. Always be looking for ways to exploit the enemy's weaknesses when he makes errors in his maneuvers. 
try to see what he is doing and then maneuver yourself. As leaders, you should not be firing your weapons except in self-defense. Your weapon is the people you command and lead. Employ them wisely or they are just a bunch of individuals and not a team and not very effective. If your people can execute their battle drills with vigor and skill, they will dominate the battlefield. I then told the men a little history lesson. At the end of World War II, when the Russians were nearing Berlin, they had overwhelming artillery firepower. Artillery allows you to apply your combat power to multiple points of your enemy's defenses. If you know where he is weak, and you can hit that. For the Russians, though, they literally use it to reduce the defensive power of the Germans at the point of attack the Russians chose. Remember that. A smart enemy never attacks your strong point. He always finds your weakest. He never comes at you straight up the middle, and neither should you. The smart thing to do is to channel the enemy against your strengths, to make what is your strength look like a weakness. But remember, folks, your enemy is not a fool. He may be better armed and better trained as well. Don't underestimate him ever, or it will be the last mistake you make on this earth. Anyway, the Russians would literally mass thousands of guns for an attack and pummel their enemies into dust before launching their tank and infantry attacks. They had rocket and traditional artillery. They had absolute superiority in this regard and knew it would decimate their enemies, making it possible for their infantry and tanks to sweep right over the Germans' well-prepared positions. This was them pitting their strengths against the enemy's weakness or ability to defend against an artillery barrage, to be specific. A General Heinrichi was put in charge of defending along this sector and knew he had very limited resources. He developed a brilliant tactic to negate this strength. When he perceived a Russian attack was imminent, he pulled his troops back from the line prior to the enemy artillery barrage. The Russians would essentially bombard an empty sack, as he called it, and their barrages were horrific and intense. Literally thousands of guns would concentrate on a single small area. They would lift the barrage and then send in their troops against what they falsely assumed would be a decimated enemy. While they were moving forward to the point of attack, Heinrichi would quickly rush his troops back into their positions, unharmed and fresh, just after the barrage lifted, but before the Soviet tanks and infantry could arrive. They would occupy their former positions and would push the Soviet troops back. That is a fine example, folks, of avoiding the enemy's strengths. Think about that tonight, and we will talk more at Training Day this Saturday. After this, the group degenerated into a lot of sidebars and other visiting. The fellowship was true, though, because nobody left for at least an hour, even though I hadn't made any cornbread. Tears. Linda woke in her bed suddenly and wept. Outside, the cold winds blew hard against the old house, making it shudder a bit. She had been dreaming of swimming in the ocean with Mark, like they did when they first met. Suddenly, in the dream, a wave came and swept him away. In the dream, he didn't look panicked, though. He just smiled at her as he washed away and said nothing. The man today made her think now of her one true love. How she missed him. Oh, Mark, she cried. I miss you. I miss you so badly. She sobbed and sat up, looked out the window at the cold night. The trees were barren of leaves, and it looked so destitute, like her soul felt. Tears ran down her face. The man at Jacqueline's place had made her realize how alone she was now, had reminded her immediately of her love for Mark. She knew that look in his eyes, too. Oh, he was polite and a gentleman, a little shy and awkward, but she knew that look. The way he looked in her face, how he held on to her hand a little long, she knew he meant nothing by it. In different circumstances, it would have been nice, in fact. She had no interest in anyone, though. Her heart was still so broken. Why did life have to be like this? Whatever happened to, they all lived happily ever after. She cried out loud angrily, Why, God, why? The silence of the world right now was too much to bear. She wished she could pick up a phone and call someone, but those days were gone. Maybe she could go see Liz or Jacqueline. They had been so sweet, so understanding, especially Liz, who seemed to know. 
It was nearly 2.30 in the morning, though, and she would not impose herself. She lay back down instead, and after many tears and weeping, she mercifully succumbed to sleep. The Seekers The wind whipping a stinging rain against his face, Danny hardly seemed to notice as he walked eagerly into the shop. The grease ball was finished with the first part of the special project, and Danny wanted to inspect it. Stamping off the mud from his boots before entering the shop, he walked over to the smallest of the recently modified trucks. Sliding out from underneath, the grease ball wiped his hands on his coveralls and smiled broadly. This one's ready, Chief, he stated proudly. Have a listen. Turning the key a moment to activate the glow plugs, he fired the four-cylinder diesel to life. Danny was impressed, as he knew he would be. He could barely hear the engine running. The belts turning on the pulleys were about all the noise it made. Greaseball smiled and revved the engine. Even then, it wasn't much louder. She whispers like my old lady, he pronounced. Danny smiled back and clapped him on the shoulder. Thanks, brother. This is exactly what we needed. The grease ball showed him the rest of the features. The back had a 100-gallon fuel tank that fed into the main under the bed. There was also commo gear, including an extended range radio that could communicate with the club's secure commo radio sets, an onboard mapping system, and a GPS, which Greaseball said was still working. Danny understood that the satellites used by the military were still working, and this system used those. Overall, it was painted the same black as the other vehicles. Danny told Big Mike what he needed, and he, along with Dirty and the Snake, gathered in the club meeting room behind closed doors alone. Operational security had been a key element in their meth business, and nobody ever noticed when he shut the doors. No one member had all the information about the club's activities. Thus, if one man were turned or he talked too much, he would not destroy the club or its business. Other clubs had been infiltrated this way by the feds and hurt them very badly. The snake was an old army ranger that had been in the club nearly as long as Danny, a man who had proven himself absolutely loyal and trustworthy. Years ago, he pulled a five-year stretch for a manslaughter rap without breaking the code of silence. Most of the members of the Fallen had done time as well. Although Dirty was new, Mike could vouch for him. Mike would not go on this first mission, though. It would be a recon only, and, as with others, Mike would plan and lead the actual raid. The Snake would lead this recon, and Dirty would be his assist. Danny showed on the map where he thought the eagle's lair was located and told him exactly what to look for. He did not say why. He did not have to. It was obvious. They had been looking for a new place, and this one was it. The location was south of Moose Look Maguntic Lake, which was as isolated and remote an area as one could imagine. It would be well hidden, but Danny had spent years looking for this place. An operation this big always had someone who talked, someone who got mad or didn't get paid, and although they had tried to keep this one quiet with lawyers and non-disclosures and lots of money, people had spilled a little here and a little there. One of the former employees had spoken to the press, and Danny had the article. He was written off as a kook, of course, and the people from Eagle's Lair had no doubt tried to silence him. Apparently, he had tried to blackmail them, or at least that's what Danny figured, and they refused. The former employee told of how they had all signed non-disclosure agreements, been flown in by helicopter at night, blindfolded and disoriented. Brought in to work for extended periods of time, with no cell phones, no cameras, no communications with the outside world, save by monitored telephone calls. Anything going in or out was carefully inspected. Everyone was strip-searched upon entry and exit. This, of course, all sounded bizarre and paranoid, and so the article hadn't gotten much traction. But it had certainly grabbed Danny's attention. He knew it was not only plausible, it was feasible. If he had enough money, he would have done the same thing for security. Only the inhabitants of the lair actually knew its location, and even then, it was select family members. The rest would be brought in when needed, at the right time. This was a smart precaution for anyone who didn't have a vested buy-in. 
Some spoiled kid would surely tell otherwise. The advantage the place had was that it wasn't near anything, and this would make it hard to find, but Danny had a single picture taken by someone from inside the compound. It was, of course, not supposed to be ta seen outside, and it was taken somehow by the disgruntled employee, but Danny recognized something in it, something in the background, that lake. He had been in that area as a boy with his uncle, long before that, hunting. It was barren and dangerous then, and had been brought up by a single large corporation, ostensibly for timber operations. Danny recognized the distant lake, he wasn't sure exactly how, but he could tell. Other fragments of information all lined up, and he knew it was a long shot, but he felt it had some fairly good payoff. They would have to be careful and quiet. The inhabitants were as secretive as they were wealthy. They knew if they were discovered, they would have little chance to hold off the hordes. Still, though, according to the disgruntled employees, they had very tight security and 50 highly trained former soldiers who were carefully selected and recruited and would be allowed to live in a separate area of the compound with their immediate families in exchange for their services. They, of course, knew nothing of the location in reference to the outside world either and would be flown in under the same veil of secrecy as the construction crews were. The compound would hold over 500 people, representing dozens of families of extremely wealthy individuals. The rumored buy-in for the place was over a million dollars for each family member, and the invitations were carefully administered by an elusive and eccentric billionaire named L. Roger Eaton III, who was as well known in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, as he was not known to the rest of the country. The fallen were seeking, and they would find. This has been chapter 14 of the e-novel, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author. Turn in next week for chapter 15. Thank you.